All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is part two of our webinar series covering the latest ICC report. Part one addressed the results of the reports on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability to climate change. Today, the focus is on mitigation of climate change, which IPCC defines as a human intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. What we've shown so far is that to be on track to meet the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels requires net zero greenhouse gas emissions by around 2050. With the present level of warming of approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius, human-induced climate change has already caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people beyond natural climate variability. According to the IPCC, unless there are immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, global average temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius is expected to be reached or exceeded in the next 20 years, increasing the risk of impacts to human and natural systems. So what can be done to mitigate climate change? Before we begin, I want you all to know that as part of us trying to communicate and clarify some of the findings of this report, you are welcome to ask questions at any time in the chat. Just provide them there and we'll address them, you know, partly towards the end of the webinar after the presentation. This webinar is also being recorded and a link will be given to everyone who is registered. Today, we have back with us and no, no better of a person to help us guide to these IPCC reports is the senior expert of the uh, CFRN team and one of the vice chairs of the IPCC, Thelma Krug. Welcome back and thank you. Uh, hello, Michael. Hello, everybody. It's very nice to be here again and a pleasure to provide some information on the latest IPCC report on mitigation. Looking forward to it. So this is the last piece to complete the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. As part of the assessment of the literature on mitigation of climate change, the authors updated the current trends in greenhouse gas emissions. So what can you tell us about that? Well, thanks for the question, Michael. Yes, chapter two of the report provides updated emission trends and drivers, but unfortunately, what is being observed mm, is not very encouraging. So in 2019, for instance, the global net anthropogenic greenhouse gases, the emissions from these greenhouse gases was 559 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. Please keep this value in mind as we will come back to it later. So these 59 billion tons were 6.5 billion tons or around 12% higher than in 2010 when these emissions totaled 53 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So if we compare 
the annual average greenhouse gas emissions from 2010 to 2018 relative to the previous decade, it was more than 9 billion tons of CO2 equivalent higher per year. And this was the highest increase in periods of 10 years on record. Wow. So what contributed most to the rising greenhouse gas emissions in 2019? OK, so we can see from this uh, slide that the largest contribution to the total net anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 was from CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and industry, 64%, followed by methane emissions, 18%, and net CO2 emissions from land use, land use change in forestry, LULUCF, whose relative contribution was 11%, or 6.5 tons of CO2 equivalent in 2019. The report, however, points out that these net estimates from LULUCF are subject to the large uncertainties and high annual variability and there is low confidence even in the direction of the long term trend. This next slide clarifies this point. It provides from left to right the global annual anthropogenic emissions in the period from 1990 to 2019. And this has been normalized. You see that all these uh, lines start in uh, 100. So they have been normalized in 1919 in the value 100. And you can see these uh, global annual emissions in the solid lines from left to right for CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and industry, CO2 emissions from LULUCF, methane emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, and fluorinated gases, emissions from these F gases, as we call them. So the table that you see also on the right in this slide shows in CO2 equivalent values, the emissions in 2019. So you can see in the total, the value that I mentioned before of 59 and what you see plus or minus 6.6 .6 is the uncertainty uh, to this. And also we see their increase from 1990 until 2019. And also the percent increase from 1990 to 2019. So from uh, that, uh, from that year, we see that the highest increase about 67% corresponds to CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and industry. Methane contributed to 29%. All these have been converted into CO2 equivalent and also nitrous oxide with 33%. And although you see the gross inflorinated gases, the highest value, the highest percentage of 250%. Uh, percent, so although this is by far the highest, it increased from very low levels. You see even in the second column, the 097, which is uh, very, very, very low in relation to the others. But what you see in the, sh in the shaded area around each solid line refers to the uncertainty range around the annual global emissions. And this highlights the large uncertainty. If you look at the second graph, it shows the high uncertainties that are related to LULUCF. Also, you can see from this uh, yellow graph related to CO2 LULUCF, the high annual variability. If you look to the other graphs, they go smoothly. And LULUCF has this high annual variability and high uncertainty as well. And no statistically significant trend in the greenhouse gas emissions growth uh, for LULUCF CO2 could be found due to the uncertainties in the estimates. So, for instance, the, while the average estimates 
of emissions from the bookkeeping models report a slightly increasing trend in emissions. Follow the dash, the line estimates. Uh, you, you see that from the National Greenhouse Gas Inventories and also from F, FAO start estimates, they show a slightly decrease in the trend, as also indicated in the dash, the lines. But you also see that in the recent years, you know, this trend is changing a little bit. So you see a small increase in the recent years. So all these are approaches to estimate the global net CO2 fluxes for a flu. Uh, and then you can see the very high differences that you have from one model to another one. So this uh, increases the uncertainties. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I have a couple of questions on this slide. Uh, for, can you give examples of what uncertainty means on this type of data? And why does Lulu CF have such a, a large range? OK, so if I wanted to give a very simple answer, I would say that un uncertainty uh, is related to the lack of the true value of a variable. In this case, uh, would be the, the net emissions. We don't know the true value of the net emissions. So, this is why we estimate them, right? And there is uncertainty in the different ways and approaches we do these estimates. So in the case of LULUCF, the uncertainties or land use, land use change in forestry, right? So uncertainties are generated mostly by different sources of data and the assumptions that are used for the different approaches to estimate both the greenhouse gas emissions and also the removals. For instance, the annual net CO2 fluxes for land reported by global models are approximately 5.5 billion tons of CO2 higher than the global annual net emissions based on national greenhouse gas inventories. So you can see different methods are providing completely uh, different figures, and in this case, very high difference. So this reflects differences in how anthropogenic forest sinks in areas of managed land are defined. Also, the limited representation of land management by the global models and the varying levels of accuracy and completeness of estimated LULUCF fluxes in national inventories. The value that you see for the national greenhouse gas inventories are those submitted to the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention. But I would also say that different uh, definitions of forest and uh, also deforestation uh, are sources of uh, uncertainties in the estimate of emissions. So different countries have different definitions of what is deforestation, degradation, and so on. And this adds up to the uncertainties that we see. Okay, got it. And um, is there a, like a method that is uh, preferable to use here? No, the report is clear on that point, and uh, neither method is inherently uh, preferable. So even when the same methodological approach is used, we still have large uncertainty in CO2 LUCF uh, emissions estimates that can lead to substantial revisions to the estimated emissions. So, but the report is very clear on this. The, the important thing is to keep consistency. So, so if you are using a reference for the estimate, you should use that consistently uh, so that you don't ch change the assumptions, you don't uh, change the approach. And then uh, you provided estimates uh, up to 2019 when the pandemic was already impacting the world in many, many different ways. And this included lockdowns. So this was expected to have some impact on the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, did this occur? It did occur, Michael. So you have references, you have some articles on, on this issue. So we did have a major break in the global emissions trend uh, and that was due to the lockdown policies that have been implemented in response to the pandemic. Particularly in transport, we're talking about, you know, uh, international aviation, but also, you know, the transport, we basically stopped the, the activities and this has had a huge impact. So overall, the global CO2 emissions from fossil fuel and industry 
in the early 20 to, uh, in early 2020 declined by about 5.8 percent or 2.2 billion tons of CO2 relative to 2019, which is, was quite significant, I would say. But unfortunately, it rebounded. It rebounded by the end of 2020. So all you saw in terms of this, you know, uh, emission reductions that came back again. Uh, but this was only available, data was only available for CO2 and the full uh, greenhouse gas impact of COVID-19 could not be assessed because no data on no CO2 uh, greenhouse gas emissions was available in 2020. Yeah. Right. And but, but carbon dioxide is the most abundant greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, and it's pretty much related to all the sectors, well, except agriculture. Yeah, that, that's correct, uh, uh, Michael. And, that, and there is a, a, an interesting figure in the report that is shown in this very next slide. And uh, it provides uh, information about the trend of CO2 emissions since pre-industrial times. I, I find this uh, slide uh, quite interesting because you can see, you know, the evolution, let's say. So we can see from 1850 until 1950, yeah, uh, you can see that the, the largest source of CO2 emissions, and this graph is only CO2 emissions, was associated with LULUCF. You can see uh, the trend or the evolution uh, in the yellow curve, starting from 1850 until 2019, and which contributed in uh, 1950, LULUCF contributed to 49% of the total CO2 emissions. And the coal came in second with 34, and oil in third with 13. That was back in uh, 1950, right? So it changes from that point in time. Uh, and then we, if we go to 1990, we see that LULUCF land use, land use change, and forestry drops from the 49% I mentioned uh, before to 18%. That was quite a substantive drop in 1990. Oil increased from 13% to uh, from 13% to 33%, and coal decreased from 34% to 32%. In gas which uh, in 1950 was basically insignificant, even doesn't show a percentage there, uh, grew to 14% in 1990. Now, if we rapidate from 1990 to 2019, we see that LULUCF and oil show a reduction in their relative contribution, right? From, uh, uh, we, we see this, this reduction with gas having the, the, the largest increase from 14 to uh, 18 percent. And I would like to note that these refer to the relative, so we're talking about percentages, uh, the relative contribution of these sources to the total CO2 emissions, which uh, was 28 billion tons in 1990 and 43 billion tons uh, in 2019. So you may now uh, ask me, well, didn't you, Thomas, say that we should keep in mind the 59 billion tons of CO2 equivalent for 2019? So why are you saying now that we have 43? Yeah, this is why we always should pay attention to the units of whatever is being provided to us. And in particular, in terms of emissions, sometimes these emissions are provided in only CO2 and sometimes in CO2 equivalent, which is a, a means to transform, let's say, uh, methane and nitrous oxide emissions into a common unit uh, that depends on how much these gases uh, alter the, the balance, the energy balance. Uh, so everything is converted to CO2 equivalent so that you have a single measure. So pay attention, always check in which unit the estimates are being provided. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, so, um... If we want to consider greenhouse gases uh, converted to carbon dioxide equivalent, what is the contribution of each major sector to the green to total greenhouse gas emissions in 2019? OK, so let's see. Uh, for 2019, which is the year we are now referring to all our uh, estimates here, uh, approximately 34% uh, or 20 billions of CO2 equivalent 
So 20 in relation to 59, right? Uh, so uh, it, it comes from the energy supply sector. 24 comes from the industry. And sometimes depending on how you do the accounting, this can, can go to 34, right? And uh, also from AFOLU, agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, uh, this is 22%. We have 15% for transport, and we have 6% for buildings, basically in this case, from heating and electricity use. So you see this uh, a big distribution, right? And uh, energy always being the, the, the champion <laughs> of the, the of the emissions uh, uh, always yeah of course of course and uh does the report provide information about how the annual global greenhouse gas emissions are regionally distributed yeah there, there are, uh, the report provides several uh, interesting uh, information right that unfortunately don't go through all that including per capita emissions and so on by region but in this case it does provide uh, regional uh, information. And uh, as we would expect, they differ widely across regions and also over time, as we could see on, on the graphs of uh, the previous graphs as well, and also across different stages of development. So if we look at this very next slide, and sorry that it's, uh, we can't see very well, but anyway, uh, you can always go back to it it because this uh, is is available to everybody, so you can you know look closely to all this distribution. <laughs> but so if we look uh, uh, for 2000 and, uh, and, uh, and 19, uh, you can see that the value 59 billion tons that you can see for 2000 and, uh, and 19, you see the relative contribution of each region to this total. I'm gonna single out only two of them. Um, Eastern Asia for 2019 contributed 23% to that 59 billion tons that I mentioned before in CO2 equivalent. That was followed by North America with 12%. And, uh, and obviously everybody can look to see, you know, the region distribution that I, we thought that it would be more relevant to say the highest ones. Yes, thank you. Um, this slide also shows interesting information about the trend from 1990 until 2019. And we can see the relative contribution of Eastern Asia to the total greenhouse gas emissions escalated in recent years from 13% in 1990 to 16% in 2000, 24% uh, in 2010, and then 23% in 2019, as you indicated there. Also on this slide, I see a peak uh, around 1997. Uh, what is that from exactly? Yeah, th thank you very much, Michael, for indicating that this slide shows much more uh, than the relative contribution uh, to the total emissions uh, by a single year. Uh, but this figure shows also the trends, uh, which brings relevant uh, relevant information uh, also. So you can see the relative contribution for each sector uh, since the year 1990. So you see a growing or decreasing so this is really important uh, information, I would say, and most likely these would be the effect of uh, uh, of changes in in production, for instance, change in transport, the way we go, the the, the way the agriculture is being done. So in some parts of the world, uh, this can have a significant uh, change. But uh, you also indicated the single peak, and uh, there is a line crossing there. It's indeed, it is in 1997. And uh, it, it relates to a forest uh, uh, fire and the pit fire also in Southeast Asia that occurred in that year and that led us to having more CO2 LULUCF emissions occurring. It's interesting how these graphs can, can you know, pick up these peaks yeah. uh, 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 due to some, you know, uh, anomalous event or events that happen in large scale. Absolutely. And then in a previous response, you mentioned that the AFALU sector uh, contributed 22% to the total greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. So how is this total distributed among the different subsectors? Can you walk us through that data? 
Yeah, that's interesting because we, we have this total, right? And then uh, if we want to understand a little bit better uh, how this is distributed uh, 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 among the different subsectors, we can see in this next slide information uh, that responds to your question and also provides many others, but let's see. The 22% that I previously mentioned for 2019, and people can see also the evolution since uh, 1990, right? Resulted from the total AFOLU greenhouse gas emissions of 13 billion tons relative to the 59 billion tons of CO2 equivalent for all sectors, right? So it's the ratio, the 22 is the ratio between 13 and the 59. Yeah? So that's the contribution of LULUCF that I previously mentioned. If we concentrate in AFOLU greenhouse gas emissions in 2019, we can see that the relative contribution from several subsectors, uh, CO2 emissions from LULUCF contributed the most, with 51% that you see there in the arrow. So 51% of, uh, of the 13 billion tons for AFOLU came from LULUCF, CO2 emissions from LULUCF. And then mainly from deforestation. So that's the champion as well. And the remaining 49% that you see are uh, 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 correspond to non CO2 emissions and basically non CO2 emissions associated to uh, methane and or nitrous oxide from uh, rice cultivation, manure management, fertilizer application, biomass burning. So you see that there is also a contribution for those 13 billion coming from, uh, um, from these other activities. Finally, this figure also shows the increasing annual rate of growth for three periods of time. For instance, for the period 1990-2000, the annual rate of growth was minus 0.5% per year, right? And in the period 2010 2019, uh, the, uh, the uh, annual growth uh, of these emissions was 1.6% um, uh, per year. So, this, this, this gives us an idea of how much it's growing. In compared yeah. in periods of 10 years, also, you can see, you know, although it's, uh, there is an annual growth, is it increasing or decreasing relative to the previous decade or so? You can make a lot of analysis from here. So you also see that uh, it, for LULUCF, you have these big changes also. There is one, one peak there uh, that can be seen uh, that corresponded to a high deforestation uh, uh, this, in some of these years. So you see this variability is mainly for LULUCF. The annual variability that I indicated already comes from that. And then we always hear that uh, the agri agricultural forestry and other land use or the AFALU, um emissions pertain more to developing countries than to developed countries. Uh, what can you tell us about this? So that's that's also interesting because unlike all other sectors, energy and uh, uh, waste, for instance, uh, uh, in this, uh, industrial processes, the alpha low emissions are typically higher in developing countries when compared to developed ones. So, for instance, the CO2 emissions from uh, Lulu CF in Africa, Latin America, and Southeast Asia correspond to 50% of the emissions in these regions, mostly associated with the expansion of agriculture into carbon dense tropical forest areas where large quantities of CO2 emissions result from the removal and burning of the biomass, but also you have the draining of carbon rich soils, uh, pitland being converted to agriculture, for instance, uh, has a, a high contribution. And if we go to the Agriculture part of Afolu, ruminant livestock of, occupies large areas of pasture, and this is worldwide. But and, and this contributes to large quantities of methane emissions from enteric fermentation. That in Latin America, uh, in 2018, uh, 
contributed to a 0.8 billion tons of CO2 equivalent in Southern Asia, 0.6 billion tons, and in Africa, 0.5 billion tons of CO2 e equivalent. But, uh, you know, these uh, emissions also play a sizable role in the total of Hulu emissions all over the other regions as well. So I was just singling out uh, in terms of importance. Right. Uh, and so far you have shown the systematic increase in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the sectors that contribute the most, the regional distribution of the greenhouse gas emissions. All of this does not seem to be consistent with the rapid and deep cuts in emissions needed to reach the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. Uh, would you say this is a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say it's a it's it's a fair assessment because despite the fact, well, but yeah, we indeed we have uh, despite the increased emissions, the report does indicate that there has been a consistent expansion in terms of policies and and laws addressing mitigation since the last uh, report of the IPCC on mitigation that was published in 2014. And these policies and laws have resulted in the avoidance of emissions that would otherwise have occurred. I always like to single this out because the only reason when there is a mitigation, and you provided the mitigation at the beginning of this webinar, right, in terms of uh, reducing emissions and enhancing the things, you would say that uh, there is uh, only a contribution to mitigation when you're avoiding an emission that would otherwise occur. Otherwise, it has no mitigation, let's say, influence here. So in addition, uh, in addition to these policies and laws, there has been also an increase in investments in, in low greenhouse gas te technologies and infrastructure. However, uh, the report notes that the progress on the alignment of financial flows towards the goals of the Paris Agreement remains slow. And uh, besides that, it is unevenly distributed across regions and also across sectors. So this is this is a, a big issue that, that no, you know, it's not a, 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 an equal distribution of these financial flows. Right. And it's and it's unfortunate to learn that the mitigation actions through policies and measures and financing are occurring, but just not at the necessary speed and scale. Uh, does the IPCC report include information on the emission reduction contributions by the countries that adhere to the Paris Agreement as expressed in their nationally determined contributions, uh, the NDCs are referred to by 2030? And if so, are the aggregated contributions consistent with the trajectory to limit warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius? That's the, the key question, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the reporters of the IPCC uh, tend not to provide, you know, individual uh, information on, on countries, right? Uh, 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 but the aggregated contribution as assessed in the global literature is provided by the IPCC. And the NDCs go mostly until 2030. It's not going to stop there, but we'll continue. But for now, it goes uh, until 2030. Uh, and there is this, this slide that I think that responds to your question quite well in terms of the aggregated contributions being consistent with limiting global warming to 1.5. And this, uh, this figure, I think, shows it very nicely. Uh, if we uh, see there is, you're going to see a, a large implementation gap from where we are now. And when I say where we are now, I'm saying that considering the projected greenhouse gas emissions that take into account the policies implemented until the end of 2020 and extended, uh, assuming comparable emission reduction levels beyond 2030. So there are assumptions to these red curves, right? Uh, based on the NDCs and then projecting what could uh, uh, happen afterwards. And the light blue line that corresponds to pathways that limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, you know, above pre-industrial levels always, assuming also immediate action 
after 2020. So when you look at the difference between the red curve and the light blue uh, line, uh, we can see uh, or have an idea of the implementation gap that clearly indicates that now we are not on track to being uh, consistent to a pathway that limits global warming to 1.5. So that's oh. an interesting figure, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, is it still feasible that we could get there? Everybody asks that question. <laughs> <laughs> we had to. <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. Uh, everybody. Uh, I mean, the, everybody sees the challenges, right? Because IPCC says we have to do deep, rapid, you know, sustainable uh, emission reductions. So, but uh, IPCC also addressed this question by by saying that uh, we are not going to be able to get to 1.5 without the strengthening of policies beyond those that are implemented by the end of 2020. And uh, and these policies are also projecting to have uh, a, a peak beyond 2025 when we should have peaked by then. And if we project then what uh, would be the global warming at the end of the century, uh, keeping this uh, path, we, we, we would be getting 3.2 degrees Celsius. Mm. So wow. models, models show that it's theoretically possible to limit warming to 1.5, but uh, the current scale, the scope, and the pace of global action pledged until 2030, basically on the indices, is not enough. And again, we are not on track. Mm -hmm. Um, so it seems that the system transformation in all areas of society needs to occur very rapidly uh, across all the sectors, energy, industry, urban areas, buildings, transport, Afalu, and the demand sector. So are there mitigation options available for all of these? Fortunately, there are. And this very next slide, it is complex when you see this on the left, but uh, our plan is just to highlight some of the sectors. But uh, what you see on the left are some options available at different costs and uncertainties in 2030 for energy, for agriculture, forestry, and other land uses, buildings, transport, industry, and other. Right. So if we just uh, pull the information for mitigation options for the energy sector. We can see that wind and solar energy yeah, have the largest potential to, to enact emission reductions by 2030. So other options include hydropower, geothermal, nuclear, and reduction of methane emissions from coal mining, oil, and gas. The colors that you see in the bus, they refer to net lifetime costs, and they range from zero to 20 US dollars per ton of CO2 equivalent, which is uh, in yellow, and uh, up to 100 to 200 US dollars per ton of CO2, which is shown in the, in the darker red, at the end of the bus. And then uh, how about the industrial sector? Industrial sector, there are also for the industrial sector, several mitigation options available for, uh, as detailed in this uh, next slide. We did the same as we did for energy, but we are now singling out industrial sector, right? And uh, we can see from this uh, slide that the switch fuel switch to natural gas or bioenergy, for instance, uh, show the largest mitigation potential by 2030. However, there's an interesting uh, consideration in the report that says that reaching the net zero CO2 emissions that, as you mentioned at the beginning of uh, this webinar, that will be necessary to be achieved by around 2050 if limiting global warming to 1.5 is the is the goal, right? Uh, the report says that uh, for the industrial sector, it is possible, but it's going to be quite challenging. 
and mitigation in the sector requires uh, new production processes using low and zero greenhouse gas electricity, hydrogen, natural gas, bioenergy, enhanced recycling, energy and material efficiency, carbon management. So since year 2000, the emissions from industry have been growing faster than emissions in any other sector. And driven by increased base, basic materials extraction, extraction, and production. So this next slide, which I also find interesting, shows the increased use of steel, cement, plastics, and other materials that occur in most regions. And although low to zero greenhouse gas intensity production processes for these basic materials are underway, they are not yet established industrial practices. So you see that for these, you, you have the, 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 the population growth and some of these go beyond the, uh, the emissions from some of these basic materials go beyond the growth in population. Well, it's at least nice to see that there are mitigation options for all the sectors. Uh, now, what does it say about the mitigation actions in the agricultural, forest, and other land use sector? And then this sector is what relates more to the CFRN activities. Yeah, so let's concentrate a little bit on that. Uh, and obviously, as the others, there are uh, many mitigation options for this sector as well. But there, there is like a, a there is like a, like a, something I have red light that says when sustainably implemented. So you're going to see this in many of the options, activities, measures that are implemented in this sector. That says when sustainably implemented can deliver large scale greenhouse gas emission reductions and enhanced removals. So this sector, the Afulu sector, can provide between 20 to 30 percent of the global mitigation needed for a 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius pathway towards 2050. And so the activities of uh, CFRN are very important in, in reaching these goals. And uh, so, yeah, so we in this is in this slide we uh, show as the previous one that we did for energy and industrial processes or industry uh, we are doing the same thing for for uh, for Afolu right uh, so it shows that we have substantial uh, potential to reduce the net emissions including by 2030 although this potential and the costs as well vary across the countries. Options that we have for this uh, AFOLU include carbon sequestration in agriculture, uh, reducing methane and nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture, reduced conversion of forest and other ecosystems, ecosystem restoration, afforestation, reforestation, improved sustainable forest management, reduction of food loss and food waste, and also the shift to balanced, sustainably health diet. diet. So I mentioned that the, the, the costs are related to the different colors that we see, you know, from yellow to the dark red. And uh, the uncertainty that I also mentioned, because these estimates also have uh, sometimes high uncertainties, and, uh, the, and they are provided in the, the, the continued black line that you see for each one of the estimates. So the uncertainty range applies to the total potential contribution to emission reductions. And it's clear that for the AFOLU, the reduced conversion of forest to other, uh, forests and other ecosystems has the highest total potential at costs ranging from zero to 20. US dollars per ton of uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, and then the report also uh, singles out, single out the comment that the implementation of robust measurement reporting and verification processes, the MRV processes that many of uh, us know a lot about, is paramount to improving 
the transparency of net carbon stock changes per land unit to prevent misleading assumptions or claims on mitigation. But the report also highlights that despite the high potential of AFULU, as we can see, the sector cannot fully compensate for delayed action in the other sectors. Yeah, so Michael, if we stick a little bit to this slide on the left, we can, this is why we provided the, the slide on the left, because you cannot read it, but at least it provides us some comparison, more or less, on the mitigation potential uh, of, uh, of the different sectors. Uh, and then we can see that AFULU has this high contribution when it comes uh, to relation to that. And yes. also, yeah, yeah. So that is interesting. Yeah, and uh, considering this large scale economic potential you mentioned, uh, what mitigation options have the largest share? The largest share between 4.2 and 7.4 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year comes from conservation, improved management, and restoration of forests and other ecosystems, such as the coastal wetlands, peatlands, savannas, grasslands, but reduced deforestation in tropical regions has the highest total mitigation. Thelma, what, uh, what obstructs the deployment of AFALU mitigation options, which seems to be so diverse and feasible? Yeah, so many persistent and region-specific barriers continue to hamper the economic and political feasibility of deploying AFALU mitigation options. So there is a need for these countries to be assisted to overcome these barriers, which will be very helpful for them to achieve significant mitigation. So I know for certain that there are several barriers to the implementation of AFALU mitigation. This includes financial support, weak governance, and insufficient institutional support. Uh, you mentioned these factors as barriers for the adaptation implementation in our previous webinar. Are there more for mitigation than for adaptation? For mitigation, there are additional concerns, I would say, including the risk of reversal and the uncertainty over long-term additionality of AFULU measures. So mitigation of agriculture, methane and uh, nitrous oxide with emerging technologies, for instance, uh, vaccines or inhibitors have the potential to potential to substantially increase the CH for mitigation potential beyond the current estimates. But they are constrained by cost and the increasing demand for livestock products, for instance. But many barriers are common to both adaptation and mitigation, including the limited access to technology, data and know-how, in addition to all those that you have already mentioned. And besides the mitigation potential, I suppose there are like many co-benefits in terms of biodiversity and the ecosystem conservation, food and water supply, wood supply, livelihoods of land use rights of indigenous peoples, local communities and small landowners. Yeah, indeed, uh, Michael, a full low carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emission reduction options have several benefits, including those that you already mentioned. But they also have risks from inappropriate land management. So the scale of benefit or risk largely depends on the type of activity undertaken, the deployment strategy and the context, for instance, soil, biome, climate, food system, land ownership that vary geographically and also over time. So integrated responses that contribute to mitigation, adaptation and other land challenges will have the greater likelihood of being successful. And of those risks that you mentioned, can they be avoided? The report indicates that yes, the risks can be avoided when AFALU mitigation 
is pursued in response to the needs and perspectives of multiple stakeholders to achieve outcomes that maximize co-benefits while limiting the potential negative effects that normally refer to trade-offs. So they can be avoided or at least minimized when these actions are put in place. Good. And is it correct to think that the Afalu mitigation is only for countries with large geographical areas? No, not, not at all, Michael. So many smaller countries and regions, particularly with wetlands, have disproportionately high levels of Afalu mitigation potential. So that's good. Everybody can be on board. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, does the report indicate how the high levels of mitigation from the agricultural forest and other land use uh, could be achieved right, and what those costs may be? OK, so report indicates uh, the need for a concerted, rapid and sustained, sustained effort by all stakeholders, from policymakers and investors to landowners and managers as a prerequisite to achieving high levels of mitigation in the AFOLU sector. Regarding the cost that you ask, the report provides an estimate of how much has been annually spent on AFOLU mitigation. And so far it has been uh, about 0.7 billion US dollars. And the report also notes that this amount is well short of the 400 billion US dollars per year that is estimated to be necessary to deliver the up to 30% of global mitigation effort envisaged in deep mitigation scenarios. So effective policy interventions and national investment plans, for instance, as the nationally determined contributions, specific to local circumstances and needs, are urgently needed to accelerate the deployment of AFOLU mitigation options. These interventions are effective when they include funding schemes and long-term consistent support for implementation with governments taking the initiative together with private funders and also non-state actors. And I know we're getting close to the hour time, so I apologize. It's always hard to cover so much information at once, but we will be wrapping up. But if just again to anybody, you're always free to reach out with questions and there will be a video at the end uh, for those that can't stay on. So going back to it, um, you mentioned the importance of policies uh, to directly address emissions and drive the deployment of land based mitigation options. Does the report provide some examples of these? Yeah, there are. Successful policies and measures, including uh, establishing and respecting tenure rights in community forestry, improved agriculture management and sustainable intensification, biodiversity conservation, payments for ecosystem services, improved forest management and wood chain usage, bioenergy, voluntary supply chain management efforts, consumer behavior campaigns, private funding and joint regulatory efforts to avoid, for instance, leakage. The eff efficacy of the different policies, however, will depend on numerous region specific factors. In addition to funding, these factors include governance, institutions, long term consistent execution of measures and the specific policy setting. And it seems that the Afalu mitigation measures uh, have all been well understood for decades, but it's their deployments that have been very slow. Indeed, you're right about measures being known for long and deployment remaining slow. So globally, the Afalu sector has so far contributed modestly to net mitigation, as past policies have delivered about 0 0.65 billion tons of CO2 equivalent per year of mitigation in the period 2010-2019, or just 1.4% of global gross emissions. More than 80% of emission redu reduction resulted from forestry measures. 
So although the mitigation potential of AFALU measures is large, its feasibility is hampered by like, uh, lack of institutional support, uncertainty over long-term additionality and trade-offs, trade weak governance, fragmented land ownership, uncertain permanence effects. These are some examples. So despite this impediment to change, AFALU mitigation options are demonstrably effective and with the appropriate support, can enable rapid emission reductions in most countries. And does the report identify knowledge gaps in the development of AFALU mitigation? Yeah, there are always, uh, you know, gaps in knowledge that IPCC likes to highlight in every chapter. So there are several that have been identified and uh, uh, I will just name some. A better understanding of the impacts of climate change to the potential for to the mitigation potential, how climate change itself affects the mitigation potential, permanence and additionality of estimated mitigation actions, as well as MRV. So additional mitigation measures need to be included in the mitigation models that take into account local circumstances and social economic factors as well as synergies and trade-offs with other sectors. This is another gap. There is also a critical need for more targeted research to develop appropriate country level, locally specific policy and land management response options. These options could support more specific NDCs with AFOLU measures that enable mitigation while also contributing to biodiversity conservation, ecosystem functioning, livelihoods for millions of farmers and foresters, as well as many other sustainable development goals. So I want to refer back to Red Plus, CFRN's key initiative. Uh, can you talk about um, how the report may, from the authors may have assessed the financial support that's needed for that? Yeah, there, there is a chapter in the report that addresses international cooperation, that's chapter 14, and it identifies that appropriate finance support for Red Plus is considered critical to move from its inclusion in many countries and disease to implementation on the ground, and that since public finance for Red Plus is limited, some expect the private sector participation to leverage Red Plus. There is also mention to Article 5.2 of the Paris Agreement that encouraged party support for alternative policy approaches for forest conservation and sustainable management, such as joint mitigation and adaptation approaches. This provision, along with the support for non-market mechanisms in Article 6, is seen as an avenue for cooperative joint mitigation and adaptation in non-market Red Plus activities with co-benefits for biodiversity conservation. And what what are the current main challenges of Red Plus finance? There are several challenges, right? But I will mention the uncertainty of compliance carbon markets, which allow regulated entities to obtain and surrender emissions allowances or offsets to meet regulatory emission reductions targets as well as the limited engagement of the private sector in Red Plus finance. So let's go back. So what makes the, the agricultural, forest and land use sector unique from the other sectors like energy wastes, industrial processes and buildings when it comes to mitigation? Yeah, the AFOLU is also saying more, yet more in the follow part of AFOLU is always seen as you know having very specific uh, characteristics. I will think about three uh, main reasons why uh, this AFOLU sector is unique from the other sectors. Uh, AFOLU can reduce emissions as a sector in its own its own right. It can remove meaningful quantities of carbon from the atmosphere and uh, relatively cheaply and can also provide raw materials to enable mitigation within other sectors such as energy, industry or the built environment. 
Another reason is that Afulu has a different profile from other sectors with a larger proportion of non CO2 gases such as methane and nitrous oxide. These gases have different atmospheric lifetimes and different global temperature responses. And so, depending on which gases are being targeted, the impact of the mitigation efforts will vary. And finally, another reason is that mitigation measures from AFOLU have the capacity to address where appropriately implemented some critical wider challenges such as large scale biodiversity loss, environmental degradation, and the associated consequences. So it's, it's really not, uh, I mean, it just goes to show that, you know, CFRN's core activities for the agricultural forest of the land use, the Lulu CF, is, it's very important. Uh, so it just makes me more proud to be, you know, part of this organization because we can just see here, um, you know, how it impacts. Uh, so once again, though, uh, thank you for walking us through, through this. It's, it's very complex. Uh, and again, our, our, our goal here, you know, for these webinars is to try to make this complicated information understandable to everyone. Um, so again, please feel free to ask any questions. Not many chances you might have to talk to an IPCC <laughs> vice chair about these questions. Um, also, we'd love to hear ideas for other webinars where we can help you uh, understand different topics. So just let us know. So I would you know, take the time if there's any questions, we can certainly address them now. Um, and if not, again, we can provide the video to everyone later uh, along with the presentation. Up here we have our uh, links to social media. Always follow us uh, for new webinars and updates on our work. Uh, and again, thank you all for joining us. Thank you again, Thelma. It has been it's been great. Thank you so much. Thanks. A pleasure, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Right. Uh, so it looks like there's not many questions in there. So uh, again, thank you. Um, if anything comes up again, there's my email address as well. Reach out to us. We're happy to help with anything. Um, and thank you all for the work. Thank you all for your interest uh, in our work and in climate change. And have a great weekend. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>